to the church. I, I, I honestly, I may have forgotten because I don't remember if I were or not, but they'll be here. Of course, next Sunday, we have Sunday, can he be in here? Anyhow, there was a little piece, like they're all big pieces. There was a little piece like that. I said, I'm taking that one too. Don't waste anything. Rebecca, am I right? Okay, you know, Rebecca's a gymnast, right? Okay, do you waste your time when you're practicing or you, you take advantage of all the time? Take advantage. She's going to be a policeman, you know. So someday you might be stopped by this young lady when you go through that stop sign that you say you never go through. I hope if you stop me, then you'll let me off. But that, that's what I tell you about that. But wasting. You know, my friend Chris Wilson and his wife, Danielle, they came up with something, which I thought was very, very cute. They came up with a saying, with a saying and I'm going to ask Chris to repeat it for you. Come up with a saying when they decided whether or not they should throw something out, would you keep the door out? Would you like to tell them what the saying is? Father John. <laughs> <laughs> They're not going to throw out their Father John. That's what he said. Should we Father John it or should we throw it out? So this young man takes what his father and his brother, and I'm sure to a degree here, what they work to have, and in modern American English, he goes away and he blows it. He blows it all. And as he's spending it and going through it and wasting all of his father's hard-earned efforts, something happens. Let's see if anybody listened to the gospel today. After he had been there a while, what happened? Uh, no, listen. <laughs> you know what happened? Do you know what? After he had been there for a while, something happened in that country. A famine. A famine. A famine. One year ago, we were in this church. We were coming up to March. Planning what we were going to do for Lent. Planning about Pascha. I had already reserved the car for the Pascha picnic. By the way, we had to that. Did you reserve the car? Did it? Yeah. We had the car all ready for Pascha picnic. And boom! Coronavirus. It changed everything. All of a sudden, churches were closing. People couldn't go to church. They had people signing up for church. I don't know. Maybe we never did the sign up for church. Maybe we were afraid many people wouldn't sign up at all. I don't know. But the point is that our whole world changed. Just as it had 100 years ago. Let me tell you a story. 
Back in 1915, 16, 17, there was an Ethiopian priest from the Middle East. His name was Yanni, Father Yanni. And he was stationed, I don't know which particular city, but one of the cities in Iowa, pretty middle America, Iowa. He was married, he had three children. And Father Yanni, there were lots of farms in that area. You know, what happens if anybody, like for example, if you're Romanian and you're in Romania, you want to come to America, if you have somebody that's in America that's Romanian, what do you do? You write them a letter, say, hey, I'm coming, right? And they say, they tell you where they are. So it happened that there were some Syrian Lebanese people living in Iowa, and one brought the other. That's how community get started. Are you from Puerto Rico originally? No, Colombia. 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 You know how so many Puerto Ricans came to live in New York? One brought the other. Why do so many Cubans come to live in Miami? One brought the other. Okay? So Father Yanni's there, and he, he was really committed to his community, so he would go around to the farms in that area, and he would confess people, commune people. If they couldn't get to the church, baptize their children. Maybe perform weddings, just like St. Raphael did in 1905, 1904, 1903. He was going around the country. But the Yanni's wife sadly contracted the Spanish flu, and she died. Now, Father Yanni had three or four children to take care of with no wife. Now, anybody would think it would be okay and acceptable for him to stay with those children, all right? Would you, would you ever would you condemn him for that? No. He went around continuing to minister to the people in the far out areas of that community. You know what happened to Father Yanni? He got the Spanish flu and he died, leaving those children. He did not waste any of his time. Another saint, St. Joseph of Damascus. You know, I like to read the stories about the lives of the saints because it inspires me. Now, St. Joseph of Damascus was a priest at the Patriarchal Cathedral, not in, uh, in, in Damascus, and the Muslims decided they wanted to get rid of the Christians. And I think, I think, but I could be wrong, I think it started uh, outside of Damascus, and they knew they were coming to that. So St. Uh, what about St. Joseph of Damascus, parish priest, he felt he had to hear the confessions, give absolution, and commune the faithful before they were killed by the Christians. Is there another story? Listen, I'll just do this. It came to a point that most people were rotting in the city, killing everybody. So St. Joseph, or Joseph of Damascus, the priest called the Joseph, he the only way he could get to the homes of his faithful was over the rooftops. And he was going from rooftop to rooftop to rooftop to rooftop. Going down, confessing people, communing people. At last he got back to the Mariamiya, the cathedral of the Patriarchate in Damascus. And as the Muslims were coming to kill him, he consumed the rest of the communion. And you know what they did to him? They butchered him. They beat him and cut him into pieces. Yet he did not waste one moment to do the right thing. So this young man in the story today, he's very important. He took what had been accumulated and he wasted it. He threw it away in prodigal or right riotous living. And we do the same thing. We in America do not save. I believe in saving. Because they come many days, it comes needs. But we live in a country where we are just consuming, 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 consuming. For example, Jacob. Now you can answer this question. You like video games, right? Okay. If something happens and the video game won't work, what would you do, honestly? You know what you do. Come on, tell us you know what you do. You get angry, and then what would you do if you get angry? What else would you do? Better something else. Well, would you ask your mother to get it, get it fixed? You'd lose it. You wouldn't. You'd accept that.
Wait the video game will answer that. <laughs> we live in a consumer society. I'll tell you one people that I respect, and if I upset anybody, I apologize to you. But I respect the people that stayed in Havana and fixed those old cars. Do you know, and I said this before they ever opened up to, hopefully they opened it again to Cuba, that it would become a tourist attraction. See, Dennis, you don't understand, okay? You don't understand. I may be, Bill may understand, Suzanne definitely understands, Gene Bass understands. When we were kids back in the ancient days of the 50s and the 60s, there were only three car companies. General Motors, Ford, and Chrysler. Japanese cars hadn't really started in. And there were only so many models. So when I was your age, the car came down the street, we knew what it was. That's a Chevy, that's a Pontiac Bonneville, that's a Ford, whatever. Then we have the peripheral now of cars. And one of the reasons back in the 90s or the 80s that the Japanese car makers overtook American car makers because we were making junk and they were making better cars. And all cars, we didn't need them there. Of course, you know what? I don't know if this was ever a plot, but I kind of believe that the cars were made, most people that would finance a car, finance it for what? You have any high idea how long they finance it for? Three years. Most people would finance a car for three years. Guess what happens after three years? <laughs> the car is done. Is that a coincidence? Or was it what they called planned obsolescence? Planned obsolescence. So we are a country that we have raised generation after generation to waste, to throw away, not to repair. Those Cubans in Havana, Keep fixing those homes. We're talking about cars from the 1950s. Okay? That's like 60 years ago. And I remember when they started to talk about other guys, you know what? I love to go down to Cuba. I mean, Cuba was a beautiful island, but I really want to go to ride in a 1957 Cadillac. Something that I grew up with. I wanted to see that. And you know what? That became a tourist attraction in Nevada. So they could not get new cars because of the American embargo. So what did they do? They began to repair. So we need to learn, as Chris Wilson said, to follow the John thing, because we may not always have them. We may not always have them, because on it says in verses 18 and 19, I will arise and go to my father and will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee, and am no worthy to be called your son. Make me as one of your servants. Now here comes the difference between the Arabic and the English. Listen. Mercy will get this. Akumu wa ishabu ila abi. Wa akulu luhu ya abi. Akhtaqtu ila al samai. Wa kudama wa nashtu mustahikun. Ba'du el ud'a laki ibn. Ish'alni ka ahadi ujraka. Ujraka. The English says servant. The Arabic ujraka, unless I'm wrong about my Arabic, refers to the foot. Is that how I put it on that? Say again. It's Ujaraika. Ujaraika. Ujaraika is a different word. I got to go there. He's saying there's two ways to say the word. It's not the same word, no problem. Okay. This is me, Ujaraika. And you, you your employee. You're what? Your employee. Your employee. And the other way. And the Ujaraika is me, too. I want to go by the second. I like the second. No, because you know why? Servants, okay, now, nowadays we have, you know, equal opportunity, we have people that would ask rights. They didn't have that before. They were servants who were like beneath anything. So the usher God, that's the way I got out of the video, beneath my feet. Okay? Servants, I remember that we were in Jamaica, my God, 50 years ago, and they had, these people were saying they were Lebanese people, they had a butler, and it was a great butler. And one day, my dad, God bless him, and I were there. My mom had gone out with the people, and we were there. He said, the book of his name was, you know, his name was Winston. I said, Winston, come and eat with us. He said, oh, no, man, I can't do that. He said, don't worry about it. Come on, eat with us. But no, no, man, I can't do that. We don't eat with you people. Now, that might be a reverse form of, of uh, discrimination. I don't know. But what I'm getting at is that he says to his father, 
I am no longer worthy to be called your son because of what I've done. Make me as one of your hired servants. Make me as one of your hired servants. We are the sons and daughters of God because of his love. We come to him in Holy Communion, not because of worthiness, but because of need. Some of said to me, said, you know, Father, I, I'd like to come to communion, but I don't, I'm, I'm not worthy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> hey, you know what? Y'all ain't never going to be worthy. I'm never going to be worthy. Nobody is worthy. We don't take communion because we're worthy. We take communion because we need to take communion. Yes, and the altar service. When I drink from the Holy Chalice, I don't sip. I don't. Mm -hmm. I drink a lot of that because why? It's the blood of Jesus, and it is what re-energizes me constantly. And finally, he says in verse 32, "It was meet that we should make merry and be glad, for this thy brother was dead and is alive again, and was lost and is found." For now, we can be happy and nufraha. While I'm sharing these words with you, I, I must tell you honestly, my attention is with Eden. It's with Eden. Being so many times there with my brother and I, I wish he would be there. If my father died, I wish my father would be there. I can talk to him. I know that his spirit is alive, his son is alive, his body is alive, he's alive. We are a people that we cry, we mourn, we're emotionally disturbed when we lose someone. And though we might like to think that people live forever, they don't. Sooner or later, they leave this body. They leave our presence physically. We can't hear them anymore. All we have left are some memories, some good, some bad. That is why, for myself, unless someone is, doesn't want me to, I would always try to talk to people. Some people they don't want you to, or they act in a manner that makes it very difficult. But we should always be a people that are looking to bring back the body. I have been blessed, thank God, to be a priest for over 48 years and to be the pastor of this church, God willing, in April for 48 years. And I will share this with you if you don't know that. I think I'm sure Gabrielle knows. When someone from our community has left the church, even if they went to another local church, I miss them. I do. John Ford just came back from Turkey. We miss you. When people aren't here on Sunday, I miss them. I'm sure that they miss them as well. And there are times when people who have gone away from the parish come back. When they go away from the parish, Believe me, I shed tears. Just like I did when my brother died. Just like I did when other people walked away. Because they're my children. Whether they're older than me, younger than me, they're my children. No parent rejoices in the loss of their child. So that when we have people that come back, I understand what the prodigal father, son's father is saying. He was dead, he's alive. He was lost, he's found. This is why this Sunday, which precedes the beginning of the Lenten journey, always touches me, this prodigal son, the son that has gone and you think they're lost, and then they come back. We should always be ready, willing, and able to receive them back. However, they must understand that it was wrong to go in the first place. You know, I love movies. And I was watching a movie recently I've seen before about Lincoln. And before the South finally surrendered, they had a 
peace conference or peace meeting with Abraham Lincoln. And his Secretary of State says, what you should have done, rather than leaving the Union, rather than going to war, what you should have done, you should have gone by the law to work it out. We don't work things out in our society. We just get angry, and we attack, and we get nothing accomplished. People need to work out whatever their differences are with a sincere heart, and the way you begin is by listening. Lula, I want to share with you and Mersha, I hope you know this. The British have funded a project in Lebanon called Deep Listening. Deep Listening. There's one thing I know about Eastern people, we don't listen. <laughs> we're only being quiet till they finish, and then we're going to tell them what we did. We don't deeply listen. So they're trying to establish, in Lebanon at least, a way of operating, a way of dealing with you by least listening. Not talking, by listening. So we can accomplish great things in the name of Jesus Christ by listening, by listening, and by listening. And if asked to respond, then we respond. It's not easy to do. But we're coming to a Lenten journey which will bring in a few weeks. Let us make that, rather than just giving up candy or going to the movies for Lent, let's give up talking so much and let's commit ourselves to listen. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Let us pray to the Lord.